Oh, snap. My man Lee, what's poppin'? I'm doing good. I sound crystal clear. I like it. I like the new studio. Hey, you're thank looking, you. You're looking skinny. I don't like it. What's hey, I don't fit. I'm skinny fat, Lee. You know how that goes. No, I don't. <laughs> hey, fair enough. Yeah, man. Thank you, though. We've uh, I've been meaning to move into some new studios for a little while now. So, uh, you know, I'm feeling comfortable. You're actually the first Skype video interview I'm doing from here. Nice. So is this is this where you do that radio show from, too? Yeah, we actually do that next door in the other studio, and that's every Wednesday. So I, I was really tired last night. I did the show, and I came right back here for my man, Lee. I, I appreciate it, but I can't wait to do it. Whenever you, whenever you want to get going, I'm ready for the for the TMZ-level questions. I'm ready to, I'm ready to, ready to, ready to go. <laughs> well, that's perfect, man. Well, we are rolling right now, and uh, we're with Lee Syatt, of course, comedian and producer and co-host of the Church, What's Hap- the Church of What's Happening Now podcast. Um so Lee, you guys started how long ago now exactly? Because you've been having a long run with the church, right? Yeah, uh, the podcast is going to hit six years in September. Believe it or not, it's crazy. Crazy, that's insane. And when you started the podcast with Joey, your role was sort of the producer who kind of was on the sidelines, who didn't talk. Is that correct? Not real. I mean, kind of in a way. Um, when we started, Joey was doing a, another podcast with another comedian. And uh, we had the idea to do one early. I was working nights. Okay. Um, and when I first talked to Joey about it, I wanted it to be sort of like Bill Burr. And I would I would be there to do the sound because Joey couldn't do that. But we would get we would have guests if he wanted to at 6 in the morning. But I didn't plan on talking. Right. And uh, he, he didn't want to just – he felt like he needed someone to bounce stuff off of. And he just said, we'll get you a mic and we'll do it. So um, – I was probably a lot less vocal than I am now, but uh, it, yeah, I, I, it was not in the plans for me at least to talk. Who knows? Maybe Joey had this planned all along, but I didn't. Right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Joey's a pretty pre-calculated guy, so that's that certainly is possible. When he first started bringing it up to you, did you feel nervous about the idea of being more in the spotlight, or did you feel like it came naturally? No, it didn't come naturally at all. <laughs> I, I moved out here to be an editor. I worked. I've always worked behind the scenes. Um, I email. I me- I messaged Joey because I love stand up comedy. But um, even before, so I've been doing the podcast with Joey for six years, but I've been working with him for seven. Right. And every once in a while, people would ask me like, "What I'm doing there?" or uh, what, what, "When am I going to start stand up?" And I would tell everybody that I I just didn't think I was that kind of funny, and I didn't want to do it, and. Uh, no, I was not. No, I was not used to being in the spotlight as as little as I was in the spotlight. On the, um, it was more than enough for me, and uh, I had, I never thought that, like, because my dad was on the radio. My dad was on the radio for twenty years. Oh wow! And uh, I never thought that that would be where I'd go. I thought I'd be editing or somewhere behind the scenes producing or something. I didn't think I wanted to be on camera. Okay, interesting. Did that spark part of your interest in editing, your dad being in radio? Um, maybe. No, I've always I've always liked making videos and, and all of that. And uh, then I went, my mom sent me to us, because, uh, I don't know, when I was in school, I wanted to just spend my summers doing nothing, like yeah. just chilling, watching TV, and my mom would never, wouldn't have that. So she sent me to a, a bunch of summer camps, but one of them... I took all the video editing courses of the, that they had. And it wasn't even video editing, it was production. The guy who was teaching it was editing on this ancient system. I have, I've never even seen it before. It was attached to a TV. But uh, from there, I went to high school and I just took every video course that I could to a point that when I was a junior, I was a TA, which is normally seniors. Wow. Um, and I just fell in love. I liked... Cause I'm not. I'm Jewish. I, I'm not good at building stuff, or, <laughs> or I can't even build IKEA stuff. It's not even just. It's sad. But when maybe when I'm edit, Jewish then. I'm sorry. I might be Jewish too then. Oh, dude, it, it's. <laughs> I, I I wish we need we need someone with your with your uh, smile and your <laughs> structure on our team. Um, <laughs> but it's not. It's not. I mean, you probably have it too when you're putting together all these interviews and all that. It's very it's very satisfying to take something from nothing and build it, and I editing allowed me to do that 
in a way that I was comfortable with technology and uh, I didn't have to do with my hands or build, like physically build something. So I, I just fell in love with it. Right. You know, that's a really good point. It's a very creative outlet, but it, it doesn't involve really any hands-on sort of exertion unless it's, I guess, going from area to area. And I think that that's also what, what attracted me to this kind of thing. I'm, I'm not a sports guy, you know, so and I do like art, but I like expressing it in this way. Um, so what was some of the first stuff that you first started working on? Were you doing like skit kind of videos or were you doing outdoor photography? No, I mean, I remember in, I think it might have been like freshman year or maybe eighth grade around that time, any time that you, we could do a project with a video instead of actually writing, I, w I would do that. Right. Um, and then sort of like middle, little, like when, when in those classes you would make little mini movies or doc I really I really enjoy documentaries actually that's if I ever got back and did something in video I would make a documentary I've always enjoyed because uh, I never felt like I was that creative I yeah. guess I, and, and documentaries are creative but it, you're following a path or you're you're trying to like learn something so I felt more comfortable that way um, but then when I moved out to LA I worked mainly in reality TV so uh, both ends of the spectrum yeah, most definitely. You got the fiction to nonfiction right there, or vice versa, I guess. Uh, the, I mean, some of it's still fiction. Some of it, <laughs> some of it's real. But I worked on some stuff that was, it was reality scripted, and they had takes, and it was a uh, very interesting, but it also kind of demoralizing. When you move out to LA, you think you're going to be working on the next Steven Spielberg movie in your right. head, but it, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, I guess I, definitely not at first, for sure. What were some of the other things that you kind of were disenfranchised about when you moved to L.A., if any? I, I got very lucky when I moved to L.A. I got a great job with America's Funniest Home Videos. Um, they're a great people. They're very nice to me. Um, when I moved on from there, I had a mix of good jobs. Like I worked on Hell's Kitchen, which is probably the biggest one that I've worked on. Cool. Um, but some of the lesser production companies and jobs that I would take, and I, I'm, I laugh now because I work a lot more now. But back then, it would it would it would kind of bum me out. Like I'd I'd come in early, and then the executive producer would roll in in a much nicer car an hour hour and a half later than me, wanting answers for certain things. And then of course, when you have to stay late because a cut has to go out, and then kind of one of the last final straws for me was I got promoted so it, what the way it works is you go from assistant editor to lead assistant editor to editor hopefully okay and I made it to, I made it to lead um, and I got a call on a Saturday night like we need you to come in this cut needs to go to producers which they never watch them maybe they do sometimes but they don't they're not gonna watch it late on Saturday night right I had my then my girlfriend at the time was in my house and I had to leave and go to Santa Monica. And I was like, if I'm going to do this, why am I making this guy so much money and not doing it for myself? So that was sort of, that was the last show that I worked on. I, I, I had been doing, I did TV for close to three years, roughly. Um, and the last year and a half, two years overlapped with Joey, but the last year overlapped with the podcast. Right. And uh, I made the decision to just go all in and just do the stuff with Joey. And it's uh, it was scary. I mean, I in theory, I took a pay cut um, and a lo lot less. Um, what's the word? I mean, not nothing is ever really safe in TV because your jobs end every few months anyways. But yeah, it's, uh, there's not that much security just going and working because who knows? The podcast could have ended 8,000 times and then. Because I, I literally, it was, it, it, I have, I just always have weird timing. I went to a meeting to join the editors guild, like the union for editors, and I, I had the hours put in because you have to do a certain number of hours. Yeah. To qualify, and then right from there, I basically just was like, you know what, I'm just gonna go and and try this full bore, and that was, uh, God, that was probably four or five years ago, I would guess. So okay. it's, been, it's been a a crazy ride. That is a crazy ride, man. That's that's. It's really cool to sort of hear a, a more in-depth history of it. You know, people seem to be sort of trained that 
they need to go about it in the original way you went about it. I find it really interesting that you were able to shake out of that at a, in a rather quick pace. But it's just like, you look at the guy like I look at the guy. It's like, why does he have the nice car and he can show up an hour and a half late and he's got all this money? Why don't I just go be that guy? You know, it's, it seems like people don't really put two and two together. They seem to aspire to work for people more than to have people work for them kind of thing. Right. I mean, it's definitely, there's pros and cons to both. It'd there be are. nice to take vacations. That'd be fun. Um, I can see... Like once you get to the level of boss when you're working in a company, I can see that a lot of people kind of slack off or take it a little bit easier, um, which who knows? I mean, that could be fun to me. It sounds like because so when I first moved here, the like, America's Funniest, they were very nice mm -hmm. and kept me on for a summer where their show wasn't in production. It was on hiatus, but I, I was able to keep my apartment over my head. But. I didn't have really much of anything to do most of the time. So I just, that's how I messaged Joey. But I, I would just be stuck on Facebook, Twitter, ESPN. And after a while, doing nothing gets boring. Yeah. It seems like, it seems like fun. It seems like it's going to be great. Um, but after a while, you're like, there's only so much. Um, there's a, a, one of the first CDs I listened to out here was a Kyle Kinane's Death of a Party. And he has a line in it of going to his day job. And he's like, it's something to the effect of uh, I'm going to challenge the internet to see how long it takes to bore me today. <laughs> right, yeah. How, you know, how long will it take for me to get bored of the internet today? And uh, it it's really quickly. So it's um, – so, I mean everyone so, – I mean I don't know about you, you but you, you've been doing this for years. So maybe you don't have it at all. And it, it's getting far less frequent now. But when I first started doing this, like every six months or something, I'd have a little freak out and and look at jobs or like, oh, what am I doing with my life? Like when yeah. I first, I remember when I first uh, stopped working, I signed up for one of those sites where you can do, um, what, the, what is it called? One of those were, uh, it's like a survey? Yes, thank you. Right. Surveys, and they'll pay you money. Right. But I did like four surveys, took a couple hours, and I got like, 2000 points which was nothing it was like so i was like you just you kind of panic a little bit but um it's i don't know i felt this pressure when i was a lot when i was younger um that i was far behind yeah and i did to catch up and i was behind everybody else and uh the older i get i realize that everyone's behind like there's not you can't really focus too much on on what you think everyone else is doing because you have no idea in reality what they're doing or, or what their life is like. Yeah, that's very valid. That's very true. You know, I have tackled that in different situations. Like with me, I think it mostly came out because I had like a really, I've had a really uh, sort of a come up that isn't by the book, I guess. And I have been doing it for a long time, but I've had a couple of points throughout that where I've had to rewrite the plot due to age or due to different things like that so in that situation it, it, like I have the experience and you feel like you have the experience and you're confident and that will help you in your next uh, venture but you're still having to build it from the ground up again so that's the times where I feel that where I'm like man like you know because because when I go for something I shoot for the top spot you know, I don't want to be uh, like a, a weather guy on the on the radio. I'm looking for that Ryan Seacrest spot. So with that ambition, I think comes that extra self doubt that when it does come out, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, how old are you now, Cassius? Nineteen. Jesus. Um, yeah, I, I think you did. I mean, it's kind of hard because I think a lot of people probably listening to this are a little bit older than that, so it's not valid for everybody. But the great thing about the way that you did it is, is you had a lot of time where you're like, not that it, it's looked down upon, but so, when you get older, like if I was 30 and still living with my parents, like that guy who just got evicted from his house in New York by his parents, right? People, you start seeming like a lazy bum. Yeah. But you, you were a kid and you just, you're like, I'm gonna do this and do it a few different ways and see what happens. And not that there were no stakes, but you, you were, you had the freedom to really explore what you liked and and you did a couple you did a kiss podcast you've mm -hmm. done you've done so much stuff and um it's really 
I think by the time you're 25, you're just going to be, I don't know, like Ryan Seacrest is going to be calling you, hey, can I get on your show? <laughs> Well, that's super kind of you, Lee. Uh, I really appreciate that, and I hope I hope that's accurate. Uh, let me go back with you just a little bit. You, you, of course, people know the story that you contacted Joey over social media. You were a fan of his. Um, this was the time, I guess, where he was starting to really blow up with Rogan, and and he was becoming, I guess, more mainstream to the underground because the whole thing itself wasn't mainstream, but there was starting to become some consciousness. Um, do you feel like someone in your position reaching out on social media for a job of of that caliber because even the importance of a videographer and an audio producer uh, has gone up in the six years since so do you right. think you could have got a job like that through messaging Joey or do you think with the amount of people the volume of requests something like that wouldn't quite be possible right now no I think it's possible but it's I think you have to be careful because I I get emails and I, I bet you have started to get emails people will email and be like hey I want a job yeah, and, and that it's a little bit. I don't have I don't have stuff for you to do. I don't have the money to pay you. Um, and I also I've emailed, I emailed other people. It's not like I I, I hit a pay dirt on my first message, but um, with what I said to Joey was I'm I'm looking to work for a comedian or with a comedian, but I don't want to come off as creepy. Do you have any ideas? And Joey's one of the few people who are is great about responding to things, and he asked me what my ideas were, and luckily I had some. Um, but I also got very low. Lucky, you said. Um, oh, did we? Did I lose? Oh, we're back. Okay. Yeah. Um, like you said, I, Joey was blowing up for the first time really on the Rogan podcast, um, but he wasn't. He wasn't so big that he already had people with him. Yeah. But he yeah. wasn't. He wasn't also. There's a lot of people who and and I'm a, I'm an open mic comic myself. So, like let, let's for, for let's just take me for example. If someone messaged me and said, "Hey, I want to do what you did for Joey. I want to do your podcast. I want to take videos and do all that." That would be great, but in reality, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take years to get these people to a place. So I got very lucky that Joey was, I don't know probably close to 20 years into his comedy career. He had a great platform on Rogan a bunch of times where they were just fooling around. I I, very, I mean, as much as Rogan is the new Tonight Show now, I, I, I am very nostalgic for the Fleshlight days of, of the Rogan podcast. Same and uh, Where it was just goof, a lot goofier and the stakes were a lot lower. Um, but I, I just... I fit in at the right time with Joey. And then also the thing with Joey that he's told me a, a bunch of times um, is that he had other people who had helped him in, in years past. Um, but some guy, like one guy was shooting something with him and he only brought one one battery and the battery ran out. Mm, yeah. And then other guys were like, hey, I'll, 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 I'd love to come do this, but I live an hour and a half away by bus and I don't have a car. Right. Um, so you just it it's possible but you, you have to put yourself in into a good position you have to be realistic and you have to um you have to work at it i mean it's but it also i got very lucky with joey this, this is something that i told i've told joey and um i just kind of said it as an aside but uh he's he brings it up to me about once a month and I've I've been very lucky to work with some great comedians. I still work with Steve Simone. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um. Very hard working. Um. But if I was gonna like line up everyone that I've worked with, Joey would be the one I would expect the least from. I mean, he 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 was a, a convicted felon. He kidnapped somebody with a machine gun. He did drugs for thirty years. Yeah. But in reality, he's the most uh, reliable. The hardest working guy that I've, I've I've got a chance to work with, um, which can at sometimes it, it kind of does like you said what what disenfranchised me about uh, L. A. It can it also when when you're working with people and you and not Steve because I still work with Steve but other people in the past they stop emailing you they stop doing the podcast after three weeks yeah or or they they continue to do the podcast but they ask you hey you've doing you've been doing this for six years. 
what do you think I should do? Okay, you should do this, this, and this. And they do the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And it gets a little bit frustrating because even if you're getting paid, you feel like you're just kind of spinning your wheels. And a, a lot of times out here, which is, I, I'm, I'm, I want you to move out to LA, but I'm, I'm glad that you're really establishing yourself out there first because I've had friends out here who, who talk to me and they're like, I'm getting 10 bucks to edit this podcast, but I have to go through and delete this and edit this. And it's, it's hours worth of work. and I'm getting $10, 20 bucks. Yeah. And, um, it's, there's a lot of people who are a not nice about paying people, but then B it's also sort of on, on us uh, as, as producers or, or engineers or whatever you want to call it is you, you can't accept those level job though that pay that kind of job because it it hurts everybody mm -hmm. because they can say oh well i i did this for years with this guy and I, I gave him a diet coke and a bag of chips every time it came over why do you deserve this yeah and they 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 see it as easier than it might be or because like you've been doing it yourself for eight or nine years, I think. I think you started at ten. Yeah. Um, you have it down to where you might make it look easy, but the same way how how Joey says that right now he's getting paid for gigs he did fifteen years ago. Mm. There's something to be said about hiring someone or having someone who has that experience who can who's not going to freak out when the tech breaks during the podcast or or you get to the studio and a light is hanging from the ceiling because it fell down and it's um it's a very old saying but you get what you pay for and it's yeah. uh i think that's why a lot of podcasts fail nowadays because a lot of people don't want to pay they don't want to they don't want to invest or treat a producer well, they and and the, what what happens I think is when you're not treated well, you're not as invested. So if if you were doing this with somebody and they're not taking it seriously, they're canceling the podcast at the last minute. Eventually, you're just gonna be like, I'm gonna go back and edit, or I'm gonna go back and work at McDonald's. And at least I'll, I'll, I won't have this stress. Right. So uh, it's um it's not an industry for people who. Uh, I don't know, thin skinned, which is something I had to come over because I'm I'm very thin skinned. Uh, but it's you, you kind of really have to grind at it, which is a very overused term these days. But it's true. Yeah, you know, it is true. You know, the, the things that become cliche, I mean, it does happen for a reason, you know, and it, it really isn't an, an industry for people with thin skinned. And, and I have I have been discovering that, you know, I've had incidents, uh, you know, over the Internet that have proven that physically that have proven that in photo pit situations. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's been good you have to come out there. Did Joey and I have to come out there. What's going on? Are people beating you up? What's going on? You guys do have to come out here. Uh, yeah, I did get beat up the one time at the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Well, who 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 beat you up? Uh, their one of their tour managers roughed me up. He didn't necessarily beat me up, but we did get in a physical altercation. He came up behind me and he grabbed me. Fuck you! You haven't been good since Californication. Leave it. Leave him. Leave Cassius alone. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Maybe I can help write the new album. <laughs> They'd probably do better. Yeah, but you you're doing which is not. I don't know. I was never a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't know how to build websites. I can take pictures, but I don't, I don't know F stops and, and Photoshop and all of that. Yeah. But, um, especially in LA, you kind of have to be a one man production company. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really cool that you're doing, you're doing concert photography, which is big out here. So you could jump from gig to gig and, really fill your schedule and be like, okay, well I'm podcasting on these days and then I'm doing photos that night and then I'm going to do a video next week. And it's, uh, it's really cool, man. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's a great point actually that I hadn't even really thought about 
about LA, you know, and, and that is a good way to, to fill your schedule and a good way to make money shooting shows. So that's something I've been wanting to take a lot more seriously. And it's nice the way that it, it, it lends so naturally to the podcast, especially when I, when I'm doing on location interviews with bands, like a photo pass just comes hand in hand with that. So it's, it's really good. But let me ask you about this. You, you mentioned how you feel that you're thin skinned. Uh, I, I, I can relate to that in certain senses, although I know it's getting a lot better for myself personally, but you know, you guys' audience has skyrocketed so much, and we did talk about the fact that on the church, uh, you, you've definitely adopted more of a speaking role and up to about two years in where you were just a full-blown co-host. Um, how did you manage the outpour of people, the size of the audience that you guys began to grow, and the amount of different opinions uh, with being uh, feeling that you're thin-skinned? It's still something that I struggle with because, I mean, the, for the most part, I, I'm very lucky. I get a lot of love. There's a lot of people who are very nice to me, um, and it's it's all very positive. On the other hand, and it's just I there's I, I'm very careful about how I say this because I think it's very uh, hacky on podcast to be like, oh, why are people commenting this? I never commented on YouTube. So I try to avoid that. It's just, but you'll get emails about hate, or you'll get you'll see comments, just they tag you in it. Which, yeah, they'll tag you in stuff, and um, it's hard not to take personally sometimes. But at a certain point, it's just you have to realize that there's some people who it's not even personal. It's just they go online and that's how they have fun. And um, it's been uh, it's been something I've worked on to try to focus on the better ones or the nicer ones because it's true. It's uh, I get a lot more love than than hate. So it's it's uh, it's better for me to focus on the good stuff and to interact with people like you who who are positive and are very nice. So um, that part is hard. Uh, the it's also, but it all it also comes with nice things. It's very it's very nice to be on a date and uh, have someone lean over and say, "Oh, I love you so much," and and uh, it makes you look like a, a cool guy in front of a girl. I mean, at a certain point, I got tired of it, I think. But um, it's uh, it's very flattering to have someone come up to you after a show and want to take pictures and tell you, "Oh, I I, I really enjoy what you do," and it. It means a lot to me, and um, that part is that part is great. That part, I I know that I was never really a very social person. Um, like I said, I was I always thought I'd be behind the camera, mm -hmm. and um, that it, it, there's no other way to say it. it. It's very flattering and it feels great. So uh, it's just it's been a learning experience. Yeah, I guess that's the only thing that you can really take from it is just to learn from it. You know, people start coming up to you in public. It it is a new thing, and and of course the amount of opinions on social media. But you know, that's something that simply can't be avoided. I always remind myself, anybody who does anything publicly, who has some note, is going to have a segment of people that hate them. So if that stops you from doing something, then that's just illogical at that rate. Um, you mentioned that you've been working with Joey for about seven years now. I was right. wondering. Joey, you know, we mentioned it even, is, is such a an amazing man, but he's also a, a layered, complex man. There's so many layers to him. Was there a specific point where you thought, you know, maybe I didn't fully know Joey, but now I feel like I fully know Joey? Can you point to that moment at all or that period of time? Um, I don't know if I still fully know Joey. Who knows? Oh. I mean, you're never really sure. Um with people I, Joey's always been very welcoming to me. I've always I've gone to his house for Thanksgiving. His him and his wife and Steve Simone were very nice and took me out to eat for my birthday. Um I'm very close with his daughter. Um so I I feel I feel like we're we're definitely more than just work colleagues. Um but I don't I don't know if there's a one moment. I think it's just when you spend a certain amount of time with someone, you, you get to know their habits and you get to know what they like and what they don't like. And 
Joey's a little bit more opinionated about what he likes and doesn't like, so yeah. it's a little bit easier in some ways. Yeah, just a uh, bit. What were you saying? Just a bit. Yeah, just a bit. He's just – um, but I don't know. It's uh, – I mean, you. how long have you been doing your radio show? The radio show I've been doing for probably a good eight months. The longer and longer that you do it, I'm sure even now eight months in – you just start to form a rapport with someone. You can tell when they want to do something or, or you, you, you just – people are very pattern-based. You can tell where they're going to go or or you can oh, – look that look means this or I, I, I know not to go with Joey to this now because he has a show, so I don't want to bother him with that until the next day. Yeah. Um, so I don't think there was a moment, I think – and I think it's a learning experience. I mean Joey – I mean, everyone's evolving, so uh, people change at all times. But um, it's really, it's just, and and this is the most frustrating thing I think when you're young, because it feels like time goes very slowly. But it's really just time. It's really just getting to know someone, figuring out uh, a way that you guys work well together, or what maybe because who knows? I mean, there are some people. Who maybe you're just not meant to work with. Yeah. Your your styles might not mesh. So uh, I I've been very lucky that our styles mesh enough to survive for seven years. Um, because I hearing that when I first started working with Joey that he had people who would go in and out of working uh, with him. That's not how I wanted it. To, that's not how I wanted. I didn't want to be just one of those guys who disappeared and and called him two years later. And I was working at a TV station in Boston editing uh, a local TV. Right. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's really you just because I mean I'm not gonna say that I've every day of seven years working with Joey has been rainbows and sunshine. We we get into arguments and. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like certain some things I do, and maybe I get annoyed at some things he does. Um, but there's, I think that there's some respect. I think that there's love, and I think that uh, we enjoy doing what we do. And at a certain point, if you if 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 all of that comes together, because nothing's ever going to be perfect, but if if you can get it to a point where it's a well-oiled machine he doesn't feel like I'm stepping over him and, 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 and monopolizing the pod, his podcast. And, and he lets me spread my wings and try different things. Um, if it's, it's a relationship as, as, as weird as that sounds, if, if, if you can get a relationship to a point where you're not butting heads, where you work well together and you gel, it's, um, it's a very rare thing. Cause I think a lot of people these days, quit and 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 don't put in the work that it needs to be and it's uh it's it's refreshing to like i said to have my best client be a a 50 year old cuban who spent time in jail that, that <laughs> i would have never that would not have been what i was looking for on zip recruiter that wouldn't be it so <laughs> you can't you can't guess you just have to uh go with the and that's that's a very hard part for me is going with the flow i'm i get nervous I want to have things kind of mapped out, um, but the older that I get, the things that I plan, not that they don't go well all the time, sometimes they do go well, but like the decision to go full time with Joey, I didn't really labor over that for a while. Hmm. I was doing TV stuff and I was just paying my bills and it got to a point where I could pay my bills I thought with the podcast and the podcast was reaching up was kept growing and growing um and I just sort of made the decision um and those decisions tend to work out as as weird as it sounds and and people hit bad breaks yep. all the time so not everything's going to work out but I'm someone who overthinks everything if I can't, there will be times if I if I'm hungry and I want to get something delivered, I'll spend two hours going back and forth on every menu, trying to figure out what I want. Mm. Um, so I have, 
it's been something that I focus on is trying to just do it. Just don't don't sit there and work out every single scenario because then who knows, maybe you flash forward 10 years and you're still working that job. Maybe I'd be editing and still getting grumpy that, that oh, that producer's coming in late and I'm – I'm nowhere different and my life has stayed the same. So uh, that that's the crazy part is just going for it. As, as, as terrible as that sounds and as scary as it can be, sometimes you don't need a plan. Sometimes the plan will come along. I mean, yeah. it, it's good to have an idea of where you want to go, but there's there's no possible way to plan everything out. As much as we want to, it just doesn't work like that. You're very right. You're very, very right. You know, it, it was really eye-opening for me the other day. I, I did an interview with uh, Buzz Osborne from the Melvins, and oh. I was sitting down with him, and I he was just talking about how he moved to L.A. when he was about 14 with, with like, no money in his pocket, just the normal story. Uh, and I asked him, was that hard for you? Was it hard for you to make that decision? And before I could even get the question out of my mouth, he just said no. He said I, I did it the second it crossed my mind. He said it just was the right thing to do. And, you know, it, it's interesting how everybody who has that drive for their passion in that way, it seems to, to mostly work out, but that's always if it's meant to be. It's, and I, I understand what you're saying, that the whole going out to L.A. and rolling the dice like that, while if you're talented and if there's evidence to show that, it will work in a lot of cases, but it's so risky. Well, it depends really on what working out means to you. Yeah. I mean, when I moved out, I moved out to LA. I, I interned out here the summer before I graduated, and I took online classes so I could graduate six months early. I was just so anxious and energized to get out here, and I thought I'd be editing. Yeah. Um, and it, that's just not where I ended up going. So it's not not that it when 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 I hear works out. In my head, I think in three years you have a mansion in Beverly Hills, and uh, you have a chauffeur. Right. Um, it's not. It's not all going to be easy, and it's not all going to be great, and there's going to be valleys and 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 dips to the to, and there's going to be highs. Mm -hmm. um, and the highs might not be as high as you th were hoping, because when you daydream, you think about getting forty million downloads an episode and. Mm -hmm. President Barack Obama was coming on your podcast. <laughs> um, Joey said something on on the podcast we just did with Bobby Lee, where he said he got a little bit uh, too focused on trying to be John Mulaney in a way to mm. to be a writer like John Mulaney is a writer, and he said I can't do that because I'm Joey Diaz and Bobby Lee's Bobby Lee, and we're all different. And I think especially with social media, what, and it's very interesting for me. I feel like a lot of people maybe your age and a little bit older are essentially social media managers now. Like they, they're very – It's true. They it's take true. it very seriously. And even if it's not intentional, you don't want to post something that makes you look bad. Mm -hmm. It's not really – what that's not our first uh, idea – so, like for me, if I go on to Facebook and I see the friends who I went to school with buying houses and and going on vacations to Italy every three months, and um, it would it, it it would get me down a little bit. But then I remember this: one of my friends who was posting those videos and taking trips to Ireland, this and that called me one day and asked me to borrow a hundred bucks so she could pay her rent. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is not, not everything is how it seems. Right. Um, not everything is how it seems. And I, I'm very lucky. I don't really have credit card debt. I live very much within my means. Um, I'm not really saving anything, but I'm also not jetting around and, and as much fun as it might seem to go on these vacations, what's the point of going on a vacation if you're going to come back and be three thousand dollars in debt? It doesn't yeah. really seem. I'd rather I'd rather sit at home and watch Netflix in my underwear with the AC on, <laughs> and not, not be accruing all this debt. Um, so it's just, 
yeah, I think I think it's and it's I yeah, it's very cliche to to make fun of social media, but not even social media, just being around people and and hearing them talk or I think a lot of times people when they get to higher levels forget what it was like maybe because they have to maybe maybe or maybe it's just they've been at the top for so long they genuinely forgot what it's like to be a sh- guy at the beginning um but they make it seem a lot easier i think than it is we'll just work hard and pretty soon you'll be running the company and they forget yeah. they forget the the early mornings and the weekends that they put in and um it's as and I, i'm not trying to to get anyone not to follow their dreams right but it's gonna it's gonna be harder than you thought it was gonna be it's um it's gonna take a lot longer than you thought it was gonna be um and something that i'm struggling with now with comedy is i i want it to i hear a lot of comics complain about about travel and oh i'm i'm I got delayed or I have to go to this city now. Yeah. And to me, that seems like the coolest, most fun thing that could happen. And I want to, I'm, I'm jumping at the bit. I'm like, let's like, I, I I'll do it. Let's let, put me on the road. Let's let, like I yeah. have 15 minutes. Like, let's do it. Seriously. And, um, it would, it would hurt me more than it would benefit me to, to get some things earlier than I should. Hmm. So I, it's a struggle for me to folk to realize that and be like, okay, just take things as they come. Don't force it because there's people who, I mean, I, 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 not even in comedy, but I, I worked with people who came out here and were editing and this and that. And now like, I'm just thinking of one in particular is working as a, pan, a manager of a Panera bread in Maryland. Wow. He's a very nice guy, but that's not, that's not where I wanted my path to go. And, um, it's just, a, I'm very happy that I stuck it out for this long. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you did, you know, you're, you're out here now in a position where you can spread that message and you have more of a platform to where you can influence other people. You know, I mean, even if it's, you know, we're, we're talking about taking so much initiative. It's even the small bit of initiative. If you would have never got up the courage to send Joey that message, we probably wouldn't be having that conversation. That probably took a minute and a half of your life. So what people need to understand is exactly that. Like, and, and we're both preaching the same thing here, really just, Take advantage of those opportunities if indeed it is what you want to do. Because I'm starting to come to the conclusion that if they don't, uh, you know, there's no use really trying to force people to do it. They obviously just aren't that interested. Right. I mean, and that was one of the other ones where I, I didn't, I didn't spend eight hours crafting an email. I I, li- I wrote a, a quick message on his Facebook wall. Yeah. I I was just bored at work. Um. So it's just, yeah, back to the thin skin. You have to get ready to hear people say no to you. Mm -hmm, A lot. Yeah, a lot more than, and even the the part that's frustrating, I think, is when in your head, you're perfect for it. They'd be an idiot not to do it. Yeah. This is, I'm, 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 I'm heaven sent. Like these guys, like they're going to be so lucky to have me. And it's kind of like I mean I don't I don't know if you've had to do it I mean you know you, you had a couple jobs mm-hmm. um, but when I would apply for jobs it would always stress me out waiting to get a response yeah and in in my head it was the most important thing that they had to do that week uh, but in reality for the most people the most important person or thing to them is themselves that's right for better or worse so you can't you can't focus too much on oh this guy didn't respond to my email or or this guy said hit me up in six months or he said no thank you and that means I have a terrible idea you have to just if if you believe in it enough you kind of have to just keep going and that's that's the great thing about where we are now is you can hone your skills and really develop in a way that wasn't possible before because you we didn't have access to that studio that you're in right now right or 
the equipment was thousands upon thousands of dollars. Now, if you have a cell phone, you have a podcast studio. Yeah. Which is, um, especially now with Anchor, something like Anchor coming out where it's totally free. Um, if, if, if you want to do it, you can do it. It might not have the sound quality that you were hoping, and you might not get the level of guests that, that, that Joe Rogan gets, mm-hmm. but uh, you're not supposed to. As, as, as hard as that is to realize, because you don't, you don't want to, it's hard to admit that you're, you're still learning or that you're, you're not at that place yet. You always, I don't know, with self-esteem, whatever you want to call it, self-confidence, yeah. you want to believe that you're the man or you're the woman and just give me the chance and I'll, I'll kick ass and you might, you might kick ass, but imagine how much harder you would kick that ass in four years with yeah. more experience under your belt and more contacts and uh the one like the thing I, going back to comedy is i've heard there's a lot of people who are at my level who don't have someone like joey to ask questions yeah and i see them going down to the comedy store or the improv and um spending hours in line to maybe go up on an open mic and they don't even get up. Mm-hmm. And the thing that that Joey's taught me is, especially now with the internet, when when you're at a place where you're supposed to be there, they'll come and get you. Yeah. Whether, whether I mean, it's a little bit different in the real world where you're applying to jobs, but you can, there's a lot of people who, Oh, I'm not going to apply to that job. It, it, it's below me or it's above me. It's an a, a email is free, so just send it to them. Let them. I I I, uh, I went to Emerson College for mm-hmm. college, and I I didn't have a great GPA because um, when I don't when I don't have interest in something, it's hard for me to focus on it. Right. I get kind of bored easily. But I I thought I wanted to go to Emerson, and I found out the guy's name who was reading my application because they were stupid and had it online um, <laughs> for the areas. And I emailed him once a week and just said, Hey, and he, some, a lot of times he wouldn't respond. And I would just say, Hey, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this. I'm looking forward to, uh, to coming and spending time in, on, on campus and this and that. And I applied early action, um, which is being like, if, if you let me in here, I'll, come and they deferred me again to coming in January instead of September um, but in reality I don't think I would have even gotten that far had I just sent in the application and let things happen so you you have to be so you, you started this off by saying do you think someone who sends an email these days could get a gig like that yeah I think it's gonna take more than one email I think I don't think one email to a comedian being like, hey, I want to make videos for you is going to do it. You might have to keep emailing the guy and be like, hey, I made this video at my local comedy club or hey, here's a a podcast that I did and just keep you in that person's mind. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's that, that's the that's the easiest thing is when when you're in someone's mind, when they're finally ready for you, you're, they don't have to go through eight thousand resumes. Exactly. Or they don't have, oh, I have, I have my buddy Cassius. He's been messaging me for eight years, <laughs> and I finally have something that I can use him for. Yeah. And you might have felt like, oh, I was wasting my time doing all this, and and I shouldn't email him. You don't, you don't, you don't want to abuse it, and you don't want to annoy someone. Right. You don't want to send an email every day just telling them about stuff, but every three months send them something hey i like this here's something i made here's what i'm doing and you'll just stay relevant yeah yeah i think that's a really really good way to go about it it's it's the same thing with interviews you know i'm out here trying to build a podcast and you know the fact of the matter is that a lot of the guests that i'm trying to get would be hard for joe rogan to get 
So you're right. One email is not going to cut it. So I, that's why I'm, I'm taking a look at my options and I'm like, what can I do? I'm trying to pull from everything that can differentiate uh, myself from the others. And that's what everybody should be doing about that individuality. You know, I, I think a lot of people would probably be surprised to hear that Joey was saying that about his writing, how he was he was struggling not to write like somebody else. Because there's so many comics, as you know, who would lo- just wish they were Joey Diaz. And you can see some guys who get on stage and they almost do Joey Diaz because they just can't help it. You know, but it's it's all about about being yourself and staying true to yourself. And and on that point, we we did mention earlier, you know, how how you said you're sort of a reminiscent about the old Joe Rogan days uh, when he had a smaller audience. And as am I, you know, I discovered him on episode 100, uh, and he's definitely 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 changed now. And especially due to the you know probably the the numbers of his viewers. Do you ever worry about? something like that happening to the church do you ever worry that the audience is going to keep growing as it has uh to the point where you guys might be advised to watch what you say or feel like you might have to um no i don't think joe i don't think rogan is watching what he says Mm -hmm. um i think i think it's that's what everyone wants everyone wants i mean that we, you start this in hopes that it'll become huge. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it, it was just more, more of just that we had, we were being introduced to all these people to Ari, to Segura, to, to Joey, to Red Band. Um, and they, they just had so much fun hanging out and Joe didn't have the platform that he had written, has now. He didn't have the access to people that he has access to now. So if 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 Rogan, 1,200 episodes in, was still wearing space suits and giggling with snowflakes behind him, he he wouldn't have evolved at all, and he would still have an audience. But I don't think it would be anywhere near the level he had it now. So Very no, true. I mean, just knowing Joey. I would be very surprised if he ever said yes to anything that would limit his freedom mm-hmm. because I, I – and granted, I'm, I'm not at a place financially where I want to be, so I might be a little bit more apt to be like, yeah, let's, let's just do it. We won't say – we won't swear, but Coca-Cola is going to be sponsoring the podcast now, so right. fuck it. Um, Joe, Joey, I think, values his freedom – especially with the podcast more than financial gains. I mean, I, 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 I do think that's the goal. And I, I think everyone would like to be at a place where a mate like Joe Perry and uh, Mel Gibson are hitting you up. Hey, I would love to be on your podcast because I know it's going to get X amount of downloads and it, all people all around the world are going to see it. But um, I think you have to, you don't want you not you don't you can't it's, it's a very fine line because you can't give the audience what they want because then they get a little bit bored you always have to be evolving hmm. but you have to stay true to who you are and and who the audience fell in love with because they're not listening to to the church for Joey to to sit down with glasses on and do a a Larry King uh interview and, and get to the bottom of all these deep political issues or yeah. or or the the cosmos and science and they're 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 listening because they like Joey's point of view and they like they like his stories and, and how he interacts with people which only he can really do that. I think there's a lot of people like you said who try to copy um whether it's Rogan or other people, mm-hmm. but the reason why it works for them is for the, uh, for the originals is because it's, it's not forced. It's not something planned or, Oh, uh, this, well, this worked for that guy. So I'll just do that. Yeah. If, in reality, they'd be better served to just be themselves, especially now. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I like uh, to watch a sitcom every now and then I, I it, it, it makes me laugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, just mindlessly, but it doesn't have as much impact as a podcast does. It doesn't have, it doesn't resonate with someone with me 
for it's just it, it, it's it's like junk food versus a steak and mashed potatoes it's right. it's um it's harder and it takes longer to find your audience i think but when once you find them and once you cultivate your type of people who enjoy what you do just because they have similar points of view or maybe they have completely opposite points of view but they 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 like getting they like what you have to say um it's it's a lot more satisfying there's there's a guy who I did a podcast with for a while who every week would get almost exactly the same amount of downloads and he he didn't have a very large following but uh he had a few hundred 500 people who would have jumped in front of a train for him yeah so that's a lot more sustainable i think than okay well i'm gonna do what they want or i'm gonna be on this show and they'll love me and and worship the ground that i walk on while the show's going but the moment the show's over they're on to the next one and it's not even it's not even a negative thing it's not like they're trying to be mean but it's they didn't really they didn't form a connection it's just you're that guy who makes them laugh on that show and they don't really know anything about you and you don't really care to share it and you're just you're reading other people's words or you're hey talk uh talk to me about i don't know like like in a ufc one who do you think is going to win between conor mcgregor and khabib Joe Rogan can answer that because he's a UFC commentator. Brendan Schaub can answer that because he was a fighter. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, they're not going to listen to the Lee Syatt and Cassius Morris UFC breakdown right? because we're not saying anything that is, is hasn't been said. But they might listen to the Lee Syatt and Cassius Morris talk about podcasting. Right. So it's – you don't – a lot of people try to force themselves into where they think is going to be the easiest or the the quickest way to make money or the quickest way to get a million downloads and you might get it once but those people are going to become very bored with you it's you know i don't i don't want 15 minutes of fame yeah i i would much rather have less fame i don't honestly i don't want fame at all like i there's a story that i i tell people I remember it clear as day. My mom was driving my brother and I to school and we were coming out of my driveway and she said something, we were pulling out, she's like, I would much rather be rich than be famous. Yeah. It's and, true. And that stuck with me. And yeah, it's um obviously money isn't everything, but I would much rather be at a place where I'm comfortable financially, where I have access to way more people than I ever imagined having access to um, in my life but I don't I don't necessarily need to be the number one video on YouTube it would be nice but uh, like we were saying earlier with the with the love and the hate the more visible you are the more you invite in yeah and I don't really I'm having a lot of fun taking edibles with Joey and, and giggling and and being who we are and growing our audience at a much more relaxed pace and, and actually and, and and having people who are with us because they they genuinely enjoy us and love us and and just it's more like hanging out with friends as opposed to hey this is the tonight show with Jimmy Fallon and he has this guy on because he has a new movie to promote. Right. And they're they're gonna talk for two minutes, but he already knew what questions he was gonna ask. Mm -hmm. And it it just gets I, to me it gets boring. It does, and you know you can you can smell how disingenuous it is right through the television, especially when it's a guy like Jimmy Fallon. You know the fakeness, and you know that's what's so refreshing about a show like The Church. It's it's so. It, it just captures exactly what we've been discussing. You know, you guys are so truly yourselves. You're you're honest. 
Um, and I, you know, I think it's, you know, you know that it's just, it's done a fantastic service for so many people around the world. Uh, real quick before we end it off, I want to know, do you remember the highest Joey Diaz ever got you off edibles? Honestly, it was probably early on, um, because at a certain point I'm still getting high, but when you first start taking edibles or smoking weed, like I remember once in my first apartment in LA, I had all the lights off and I was watching the movie Friday on my laptop. And I could see the bad, like I loved the movie Friday, but I got so high that I could see the acting and my li- literally my eyeballs were vibrating. <laughs> it was one of my very first experiences with it. And I mean, I, I've done, we've kind of cooled it down in the past six months. There was a point the most I've ever taken was 3,000 milligrams. Oh, my God. Way more than I, any human should ever take. How are you alive? <laughs> but it's kind of, your body kind of shuts it down at that point. Like, it, 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 you, like, now I'll get higher on, and this is still more than a lot of people take, but if I take 400 now, like, I'll, I'll really get cooking, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but no, it's kind of hard to, to pick out one point just because we've done it. I think we 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 just went over 600 episodes. I would say less than 15 of them have been without edibles. I think wow. it's probably less than 10. So it's it's I've had a I've had a lot of edible training as they say. Yeah, Joey's been giving you your training. What is it with Joey and the edibles? I know he loves to smoke his weed. What is it about the edibles? Does he ever say or is he just set in his ways? Well, I mean, what he just likes getting, he just likes getting stoned. I, just I, as uh, stoned as you can get. Yeah, he. I mean, he still <laughs> smokes. He, he does everything. Uh, right now, he has a couple flies that he's he's put into <laughs> some weed experiments in a jar. Um, I think Joey. I mean, Joey's been very open about his his struggles with with drugs, and he uses weed as a as a a way to not have not have the urge to go back to those stronger things. He likes having a good t- Joey's really I'm I've been back and forth on the age. I think Joey's like 13. <laughs> like if if, if 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 Joey was like if you had a mental age, he's very smart, he does he's very he's great with business. Yeah. But if you were just going to hang out with Joey, Joey's like a big 13-year-old. And he likes <laughs> Not that if you're 13, you should be smoking weed. Um, with Joey. <laughs> right, especially not with Joey. Um, but he likes to giggle. He likes to fart and watch Bruce Lee movies and get and get stoned and, and, and laugh. I mean, I don't – we do it before the podcast. I think, honestly, it probably started as a way for me to loosen up a little bit. Um because uh, I was a much shyer, dorkier guy six or seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just think he enjoys it. I don't, I don't think it's anything – I don't think it's anything even really cal- – like we were saying, all that calculated stuff. Oh, hey, maybe we'll do a podcast where we take edibles and, and that's the gimmick. It's not It's not a gimmick. I think Joey would be taking the edibles <laughs> if he was selling cars. I mean a lot of – th- with him – We'll finish a podcast and he'll start taking bong hits and be like, "You want another bong hit?" And <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I, I I genuinely don't. I'm higher than than anyone should ever be, and <laughs> I just think he likes taking bong hits. That's just he's very simple like that. You know, it's true. I mean, some people might think that since you guys do like he does the wake and bake uh, Periscope session and then he just does the pre pre church session on Periscope, people might think it's planned. But I, I guess you're right. My theory is that he doesn't do it for the camera. The camera just happens to be on and it's just capturing Joey's everyday life. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's been doing he's been doing that for, God, probably 45 years now, just yeah. smoking nonstop. Um, and. I mean, obviously, when the when the periscope is on, he's he's interacting with the periscope. But mm-hmm. he's the same way. When I go over to his house, we'll go into his office, and we'll go into his backyard, and, <clears throat> and excuse me, and just smoke. And it's uh, we get higher. Like the other night, I went over, 
and he gave me an edible and we watched uh we watched the odd couple and watched some TV before I had to go do my spot. Mm-hmm. But he'll call me he'll call me and just be like, "Oh, I found I found these expired Chiba Chews. I'm I'm going deep by myself on a <laughs> on a Saturday." Like he's just alone. <laughs> Just enjoys it. I th- I I think that's um, something that not a lot of people do is finding what you really enjoy, what makes you happy. And with Joey, it just so happens that getting blasted to the moon on edibles and smoking weed. And the crazy part with him is he can still function better than I can. Right. He can take all those edibles and smoke, and he'll get quiet and and he'll 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 whisper a little bit. Um, and there there have been times where he gets really high. He might fall asleep for a minute or two. Yeah. But Joey can still drive, can still get on stage, can still play with his daughter. It's um. It's not. He's not doing it to a point of really like obliteration. It's just. He has the the tolerance now where he's just doing it, and he goes about his normal life like that. Like that's the part I actually got annoyed with him the other day, because I'll I'll do I'll get home sometimes from the podcast. Like some I've passed out, not passed out, but fallen asleep after the podcast, and I'll wake up at like two in the morning in the studio, and I still have to put the podcast up. <laughs> he'll leave he'll leave sometimes around midnight and call me at six in the morning, being like I'm doing kettlebells. Crazy. Uh, I've sent 14 emails. Uh, <laughs> Jews don't sleep, and <laughs> and it that that I think that's where he really sets himself apart. Is it really sometimes will affect me the next day? Like not hungover is not the right word because I think hungover is a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, when you're when you're drunk and you feel sick, sometimes I, I just feel tired. And mm-hmm. who knows? Maybe Joey feels just as tired and. And just forces himself to get up. I, I'm not as strong like that. Um, but he does. I don't really ever see him take that day off after a lot of edibles. He's up the next morning and sending emails. Like if, if we looked at my phone, and it's been getting, it goes back and forth. We there was a about, probably about a year where like six in the morning, seven in the morning, the phone would be ringing. Just the stuff that like. You pick up the phone, you're like, good morning, and he, he's already halfway into wake up, you you lazy piece of – like, <laughs> Jews don't sleep. You you should be at the bank already counting $20 bills. <laughs> I've already sent 17 emails. I have four I have four meetings today. Get up. And then, he, and then he'll call back 30 minutes later. Um, but it's – as much as sometimes you're like, Joey, pl- please stop calling me. It's uh, you can tell that he cares and that he's having a good time, and he's also it's almost like a parent in a way. Like you, you never want your parent to be right. You're like they don't know mm-hmm. what they're talking about. They're they they they're being crazy. This is Jew. Of course, Jew sleep. What is he talking about? <laughs> or or, like, but then a month or two later. You'll see what happens when you wake up early, or you'll see what happens when he just with him, where he goes and, oh well, I went to I, I've been doing this, and now I have this bit worked out, or I have a meeting to pitch this now, and as much as as much as you might not agree with his methods, you really can't argue with the results. Yeah, you know that's very true. He is world renowned as. You know, incredibly dedicated, hardworking. He's up earlier than everybody else, and you're right. You know, he he has to deal with those come downs. I'm sure from the edibles. You know, I eat half a brownie. I'm crying for three days. You know, but you you still got to push through it. I can't imagine the amount of milligrams he's taken. But that's really cool. You know, it, it must be just an incredible uh, experience just spending so much time with Joey. I think it's prime for a reality show. Honestly, you should take a look at that, and you could edit it yourself. Well, I would. Um, I might be too high to edit it. We might. We might need to get someone else to edit it. But no, it's been. Uh, I would have never have guessed that, that this is where my life would be. Um, I am very lucky to to have gotten to be mentored by by him and and just hang out and and laugh. And I remember. Uh, I remember when he told me that his wife was pregnant. It's. Uh, 
it's just been a, a, a very crazy but fun journey. It's it's a lot more fun than being stuck in an edit bay for 12 hours a day. Yeah, most definitely. And now you're doing stand-up. Yeah, yeah, I just started about seven months ago. What's that been like for you? It's been great. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I've been very lucky that because of people that I've met through Joey, um, I'm getting asked to do spots on shows that – someone six seven months in probably wouldn't Mm -hmm. um but it's also because i got someone got mad at me the other day because of that um but it's also i'm very conscious of that and i i don't i would never want an audience member or another comic to be like oh well he's here because of joey but he kind of stunk and and uh we'll get him off as soon as possible i like when I first started going to open mics, there were people for months who didn't know what I did or who I worked with. And I, I did that on purpose mm. because I, um, I very much want to earn it. I, 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 this isn't, who knows? I don't, I don't necessarily know if in 10 years I'll still be doing stand up and be headlining. Um, that's probably in 15 years or 20. Um, but I, I want to get what I get because I deserve it and I want to get it. Um, I don't want to get pity laughs. I don't want to go up there and, and, and just get laughs because of, they know me from, from Joey's show. I want to go up there. Right. Yeah. And really, and really work at it. I mean, you worked at a comedy club for a couple of years, it seemed, or at least a year. Um, you've probably seen very good comedy and you've seen probably a little bit of, subpar comedy and um that i mean especially with comedy like that's why i hit joey up is i was just always a fan of stand-up from the time i was a kid and i don't want to put out bad comedy i don't i don't want to just do it to do it um so i'm really enjoying going and doing open mics and we, we just had my buddy uh, eric rocha the last episode he's a guy who i met through open mics and um it sort of coincided with my my breakup. Uh, I was with someone for four and a half years, and I just wasn't ready to get married yet. Um, and I I it was always hard for me to make friends. I wasn't I'm not the kind of guy who can just walk into a room and start talking to people. I'm kind of shy. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's given me a place to make friends and to be social. Um, sort of like what we were talking about earlier with the editing. Yeah. It's it's another form of that. It's another form of okay, I had this idea, and I I spent all day working on it, and then you bring it to stage, and then no one laughs, and then you're on stage, and you get a quick thought, and you say it, and the room explodes, and you're like, oh, okay, let me take that back and work on it a little bit, and and take it from just an idea to a place where now it's a five minute joke. And I'm I'm only seven months in. I mean, there there are comics who have twenty minute long bits and twenty minute long stories, and the idea of doing twenty minutes right now to me gives me like heart palpitations. Like that's that's my goal for the end of the year is to get to a place where I could do a twenty minute set. Nice. Um, but it's very satisfying. It's a, it's a lot of fun to to get on stage, especially with people like I just did a show a couple weeks ago at a detox facility. It's like where people go when they're detoxing from drugs. Cool. And uh, it was it was cool, but it was um like they we had to start early because their drugs like their their medication starts kicking in around nine o'clock and they start getting sleepy. Oh. Um and they had no idea who I was and they who knows if they'd ever even listened to a podcast before. Um but it's it really shows you if your material is funny, uh, it shows you what you need to work on. And cause I've, I've been very lucky. I get to do, I remember the probably, I think the first big show that I did with Joey was in Austin, Texas at cap city. Mm-hmm. Danny on the rapper was in the back and there was about 300 odd people in there. And I, I did fine on stage, nothing to write home about, but I did pretty well. But I, I went up and I, against the back wall and my legs shook for about 10 minutes because wow. it was just so overwhelming um and it was just it it's it, it's 
it's such a journey and you have to become comfortable and you have to put yourself in situations that don't make you feel comfortable that you're maybe not in front of your audience but it it shows you it shows you where what material is good and what material you need to work on so it's like the whole thing of what we were just talking about about building your career I think within and it's not just limited to stand up I think a lot of stand ups do podcasts so it makes it seem like it's only stand up that's true but I think any, any job you're in is you just have to you, being comfortable is overrated, essentially, is, is what yeah. I'm learning. Even though it's a lot of fun, is you have to put yourself in situations so that 10 years down the line, when you're getting asked to be on TMZ, you're not overwhelmed and you don't freak out and you don't you don't clam up. You, it's, uh, you have to put yourself in, in those situations so that when, because at that point, and when you're doing it by yourself and you're the one who is initiating it, you're kind of still in control. Yeah. If, if you put all that work in and you get the big call one day and you're just not ready for it, that would be devastating. That would be for sure. I just put all those, what did I put 10 years of my life into? Um, so you don't, you don't, I, that's what I don't want to happen. So I'd much rather bomb now than than bomb in in front of a thousand people later right well that's so cool man seven months into comedy you're you're kicking ass way a bit bigger than me there i still haven't uh felt the energy was right for me to start but i'm wanting to start and uh seeing you start is definitely uh helps inspire me there absolutely thank you very much when are you coming out to la buddy How, you, you've been saying it for years oh, are, you, are you thinking about it what's the uh what's the plan on that I am thinking about it. You know, it, it's it's almost like one of those things, I think, where that you mentioned, like you don't want to get certain opportunities too early. And I look back at the two times I almost went to L.A., and it would have been really nice. It would have been fantastic to see you guys and everything. But now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it in the way you framed it. It's going to be even nicer um, when the time does come. I'm hoping – I'm definitely going to be coming in uh, 2019 – um, you know, there's a lot of connections that I want to meet up with and I really just want to go and have a lot of podcasts and hopefully get on some shows there where I can gain some more exposure to and bring it back to Canada. I think that one without the other uh, is remiss. So, so that's my plan, man. Yeah, I, I like, I mean, as much as I'd love to have you here, um, it's so expensive to live here now. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly think... <coughs> It's not dying, but L.A. is getting so expensive, and the only reason you live here is to work in TV and movies. Like that's why people, that's why everyone moves here. Yeah, commercials, entertainment, whatever you want to call it. Um, but if you could have a house in Canada for what I'm paying for an apartment here, and you could be close to your family and be more comfortable, but then go on the internet and do these, these podcasts. For a couple every every few months, mm -hmm. and and get the work that you need to do, but then live somewhere where you're comfortable, and and live somewhere where you can be a normal person, rather than be focused all the time on how many followers you have, or or am I do I have the right agent? Uh, there's really there's no rush to get here, so yeah. don't I think you're doing a great job. Well, thanks for that. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, it is a big, big decision moving somewhere, especially somewhere that's wrapped up in so many specific things. Uh, you know, so I do observe that and I'm like, I've never even been there yet. You know, I always used to say I wanted to live there, but I haven't even been there yet. So I want to go and experience it. And, you know, I, I think I'll probably lean more towards what you're saying because I see the way that Hollywood affects certain people and I don't want to end up going down that path and, and having that my personality type change. So, Lee, I, th I thank you so much for coming on the show, man. You dropped some tremendous knowledge today and I know the listeners are really going to love this. Can you tell us uh, where we can find you on social media, what's coming up with the church, and, of course, any dates? Absolutely. Uh, my, I'm on social. I don't really use Facebook that much anymore, so I prefer uh, Twitter and Instagram. It's just my name, L-E-E-S-Y-A-T-T. -E -E um, no real dates coming up yet. Um, I, I might be coming uh, with Joey to Boston in, in September, uh, so that would be great. So go and either way, go see Joey at the Wilbur Theater. Um and that would be amazing. 
I'm I'm working on a website idea, so hopefully when I I have that a little bit more concrete, I'll come back on and and share my idea with you and your listeners. Um, but that's really it uh, as far as what's going on with the church and what's happening now. Uh, if you haven't heard us yet, we've done over 600 episodes, um, and uh, we have we always have great guests lined up. I uh, I try not to pre-announce them because as as you know. Uh, Cassius sometimes guests t- uh, change and and you don't and schedules get crazy. So we've had people like Danny Brown on, we've had Joe Rogan on, we've had Gabriel Iglesias on, we've had um, amazing people, and it's it's uh, it's a gr- I have a lot of fun doing it. So if you haven't listened to it yet, I'd love to have you. Yeah, absolutely. Highly recommended by me, of course. One of the shows that got me into podcasting. And Lee, happy belated as well, my friend. Thank you very much, sir. When when, when is your birthday? When do you turn 20? November 5th. And actually on that day, the day after on November 6th and 7th, Drake is doing two shows in my hometown. So I'm really hoping to be able to pull a podcast birthday kind of thing. You kind of look like you could be like Drake's little brother almost. That's good. You know, in Canada with the ladies out here, that works well. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! I can't even imagine. But uh, let, let's get let's get the word out to Drake. Let's get Drake on the on the Cassius Morris show. Yeah, let's holler at Drake. Hey Lee, thank you so much. We'll be talking soon, and uh, I'll send send you the link when this is up. Thank you again. Absolutely, buddy. Thank you. All right.